My name, Laura Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. Born and raised in the Midwest of the United States in Wisconsin. I grew up in a family business, a small business, where I saw my parents start a photography studio from the ground up. I learned a lot of my work ethic from my parents. Uh, I learned the core value of which I preach about today, that even though you may think your job is nine to five, a career is 24 seven. And I saw my parents execute their successful business on that basis. So growing up in a studio really taught me a lot about work ethic, about working productively with each other, as well as with clients and customers from all over the country. I, um, after uh, completing high school, uh, my small town of 6,000 people, I left it for college in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And it was always my uh, dream to go to St. Norbert College. It's where my sister went to school, so I thought I would love it. But after a year and a half, I really realized I, I achieved as much as I was going to there. I was very active academically and very active socially with different um, organizations and service groups on campus, which I think is a very important way to round out uh, the academic experience. I believe when you cross the stage on graduation with your diploma, you're not only responsible for and receiving an academic foundation that shows you've had proper training and proper grades, but I believe wholeheartedly it's very important that you cross the stage also with a social foundation. And that social foundation is as valuable as an academic foundation. And that is because when you are out in the workplace, now in college, you may have been at a service event raising money for a local organization. You've been maybe at a college activity on campus or an intramural sport or an athletic game or a fun quiz night uh, at the campus pub. And all of that is setting your social foundation for what comes next, because out in the workforce after university, when you are asked out for a happy hour or a mixer or a networking hour with possible colleagues, that's where you're not just going to see how much fun you can have or what you can drink at the open bar for free, but that is your opportunity to mix and mingle, to have conversations and find out where the next job might be, where the next promotion might be happening, and what's happening within the company you're working at or maybe one that you want to work at. It's an incredible opportunity. And again, you go from partying and being involved at university to now very seriously taking the social atmospheres you'll find yourself in. That also parlays right back to the fact that even if your job's nine to five, Your career is 24-7, so when you're out in the evenings or when you have a lunch in the afternoon, you're never, ever, ever off the clock, so to speak. When you go to a party in the evening, you check in or uh, punch in on the virtual clock because you never know when the next conversation will be the conversation to change your life or that of someone else. And so that's why I believe strongly in both an academic and a social foundation through university, uh, whether that be a major university or, as we call them in America, a smaller community college. In any of those situations, you can grab and learn uh, socially that will carry you through. After that year and a half, I went for a program for a semester at the American University in Washington, D.C. It was there that uh, I was participating in a semester program. It was sort of like doing a semester abroad, but it was right here in the United States. Instead of taking traditional classes every day, 
It was set up in a format where three days a week you listened to speakers and were out in person throughout Washington, D.C. for whichever specialty you chose. Uh, different specialties you could study for that semester included museum studies, political science, criminal justice, peace and conflict resolution, and journalism. I chose to take that semester and study museums because I had been so nose to the grindstone studying for communications, which is what my degree was to be in, that I decided for that semester I would do something that was somewhat related but outside of my usual day-to-day. Uh, so that I could learn in a different way and take lessons from a different situation and see how it applied to my life and my future. Now, along with that, after those three days a week, the two other days a week, you would get an internship at a local corporation or uh, U.S. Capitol Hill office or beyond. Now, this happened to be January of 1993. President Clinton was sworn in January 21st, 1993. I attended that with some other friends from American University as a student, just on the National Mall. And then there was a call that came in from a former student of the American University Washington Semester Program to my roommate's professor in journalism. And he said that he was on the presidential transition team, that they had no intern program set up at the White House, but they knew that starting on day one after the inauguration, they would need help. And could or were any students in the Washington semester not placed yet or could come and volunteer but have it count as their internship? And I was doing a small internship at the time we had a PR company within a law firm, and I was answering phones and making copies, getting coffee, just like everybody does for a, 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 a first-time internship. And that was fine because I could soak up and watch what was happening around me. But it was very small. So when my roommate told me about the professor in her class making this announcement, I contacted this gentleman who did the American University program two years earlier. I met with him, and he said, listen, the day after the inauguration, we're going to need help. But it's not going to be glamorous. You're going to be answering the phones, getting coffee, making copies, you name it. It's grunt work. And I said, well, that's okay. That's what I'm doing now in this tiny PR firm within a law firm. I'd rather do it at the White House. <laughs> and so I started the day after inauguration answering phones on a banquet table aside senior citizens and that were volunteering. I noticed that the staff for the White House press office, did not come in at 9 o'clock and leave at 5 o'clock. And I started realizing they had a 6.30 morning meeting every day. So the phones would already be ringing, so I just took it upon myself without being asked because of how I was raised with that work ethic and knowing that I had four months in this volunteership, four months, and I decided if I am living out in Washington, D.C., doing this semester away, I want to make the most of these four short, fast months I have. So I would get to the White House at 6 a.m. I'd answer the phones while all the staff were in that meeting. I would stay there until 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night because they stayed there really late. So I stayed there as late as I could while still being safe to take the subway back to the camp back to the campus. And during that, it didn't just give me better phone skills to answer the phone. What it ended up doing is it gave me access. It gave me access to the staff. Um, they got to know my name. Um, if they needed something copied, I said, I'm on it. You need something replaced in the, the ink and the printer? I'm on it. And I would keep a notepad next to my phone and I would write down who was getting what calls. And I would always ask on the phone what it was regarding so I could figure out what it was about. Because as you can imagine, in any environment, whether it be the White House or a corporation or a nonprofit foundation, days are busy. And the staff 
especially in this case, they were just getting to know their way around the White House. They didn't have time to explain what was happening for the day and this is what to expect. So I took it upon myself to ask questions when people called in. And then I took notes on it and I would record who got how many calls. And then if somebody had a, a larger amount of calls than somebody else, I'd say, listen, it looks like you're really busy. I also noticed you have an event on Thursday. I'd love to come in and help you with anything you need, even though that's not my regular day to be here answering phones. And they'd say, great. And now because of my taking it upon myself, not bothering the staff by saying what's happening, what's going on, but figuring out myself and then offering my services because it was for me about learning something. And, and I knew I could learn more by giving more of myself. I mean, I could have been back at campus having lunch with my friends during the day or running around DC during the day, but instead I would go in and I knew how valuable this was. And I only had four months in which to get the most out of it before I went back home. And so now I would escort a television crew from the main gate of the White House to the Rose Garden for an event. But then I got to stay in the Rose Garden and watch the event unfold. And I would observe it. And through observing, I learned a lot. And then I was able to, at appropriate times, ask smart questions about maybe how they did what they did or why they chose to do it in such a way. And that's how I learned. Um, I continued doing that for those four months. And they got to know my name. The one other volunteer from American University, I can't even remember her name because she just came in nine to five. But they got to know my name. And then they asked me to stay on for the summer if I'd like to as a volunteer while the or original intern program started up. And I said, absolutely, because I knew that I was still learning. And that has always been the measure I have used in any situation, whether working with a client or studying at a university or studying a certain subject. Am I still learning? Am I still passionate? Am I still getting something out of it? And am I giving something to it? And I was. And I stayed that summer with four other girls in a one-bedroom apartment. I was not getting paid. We lived on, uh, on noodles and pasta. And, and, uh, but that summer, I was at the White House every single day, seven days a week with all the staff. And I was able to help them get that intern program started in the press office. I was answering phones a ton, but I started working additionally one-on-one -on -one with the staff when they needed it because they knew they could call on me for something. So after the summer ended, the Healthcare Security Act was introduced, of which Mrs. Clinton was very involved in with the president. And at that time, I had been working a lot with the director of television for the White House, but there's only one director of television. So when she started traveling for the Health Care Security Act, they asked me to do some traveling with her to oversee her television just because they needed somebody to coordinate that on the road. And because I had witnessed it so many times just as a volunteer with the director of television, um, they asked me. And so I did that. I was not getting paid at this time. But I knew I was going to be learning something more and I was going to be doing something more. So I said, yes, thank you. And then it came time to go back to school where I was transferred to in Chicago. And uh, I called my parents and I asked if I could stay because all of a sudden, you know, it was four months and I knew I had that original four months. Then it was the two and a half months in the summer. But then I was still learning, and all I knew is that the administration was going to be there for three and a half more years because the president has a four-year term, maybe four years after that, but who knows. And it was because of that that I called my parents and I said, I'm still learning. Can I stay? And I stayed. And then I was hired on as a staff assistant. And um, from there, uh, six months later, the Midwest press secretary left, and I filled in. I just filled in because that's what you do. That's what you do in a family business. That's what you do in a global business. And I jumped in, handled what needed to be handled while I suspected they were looking for a replacement. And then they asked me to become the replacement. And I was thrilled. 
And so that was when I was um, 21. I had just turned 21 and I became the White House uh, Midwest press secretary. And uh, it was through that job that I continued to grow, learn, ask questions, help out. Did it matter that I had a really cool job or not? I wanted to be there for anybody if they needed extra help, and I had time. And then the White House director of television left a year and a half later, and they asked me to fill that role. And I actually said no because I really liked being the Midwest press secretary. But as in every situation, sometimes having a mentor, somebody that um, has been around longer than you, for example— um, or maybe has different experience than you, but is the same age, can really help you see things in a new way. And that's when uh, the president asked me why I didn't want the job of the White House director of television. And I told him, sir, I, I love it, but, you know, I, I really love what I'm doing, and I'm from the Midwest, and, you know, this is great. And he said, yeah, but you know how to do that, and you're good at it. He said, I can see your face light up and how much you enjoy this. So you really should take this leap and do this now. And so I said, yes. And I became the White House director of television and I never regretted it. I regretted not saying yes faster because I was learning other skills and I was pushing myself to new limits and I was traveling with the president and learning new things. And that was a great experience. And then in 97, the White House director of events left and the president and Mrs. Clinton asked me to take that position. And the only way I could ever take on that position is because I did all of the positions before then. So it was a combination of work ethic, helping others, even when they didn't expect it to be helped or when I wasn't expect to help. And I said, Hey, can I, you know, take care of this? Or it looks like you're really busy. Do you need an extra hand? That's what got me known as the worker. As, uh, and, and I never, and, and it's very important that when you do that, you um, put the credit on those that originate the project. You do not take the credit yourself just because you jump in. Because I believe if you work hard uh, without trying to be noticed, but just work hard and do well, you will be noticed. Uh, having a good reputation, having uh, gaining respect of others, gaining the respect of others. I wish I didn't have my plan as uh, as solid as I did, because I had mentioned at the beginning how I always wanted to go to St. Norbert College. My sister went there, so I was going to go there. That was my plan. And then when it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and maybe a little too small, and I wanted to try something different, it probably took me an extra few months to figure it out because I just assumed, well, this is my plan. I need to stick with it. But really, that time in your life is the best time to deviate because you've got the time and the ability to do that. You're not going to lose time. And I think it's really important for people to realize they have no shelf life, no shelf life on their career, no shelf life on on college, this is your time to make decisions. So yeah, I think for me, it was, uh, I, I wish I had less of a plan so that I could have been more flexible um, earlier. Oh, very good question. Um, I have to say, I think one of the biggest skills that has been toughest for me to master um, because, uh, Hey, you want to please everyone. You want them to, uh, like your product. They, you want them to like you. And I think it's at those moments we can undervalue both our idea or business plan or our worth because we want it so badly. We want people to like our projects so badly or we want them to want us involved so badly that we can sometimes undervalue ourselves monetarily and um yeah basically monetarily um so the better you can know the worth of your project and what you're bringing to them the better you can i think i believe take be taken seriously um, so it's knowing your value and that's both monetarily and your experience that you bring compared to what else they might be looking at. 
face to face communication works. And I believe that there is no substitute for face to face meetings. Social media and technology have greatly improved our lives and staying connected, but it cannot become the substitute for face to face. Because if you're an entrepreneur and you want somebody to buy into your project, if you want them to use what you're creating, you have to be willing face to face to show your passion and your smarts and your willingness to work with them because that's how it's going to come across. And by the way, with events, like I just said, best way to communicate a message, whether you're attending one or putting one together to showcase your product or project, if you have somebody in person, experience it, see it up close, they will leave not just having had the opportunity to see it in action, but they will leave as an ambassador of your project because they'll go back to their offices and tell somebody about it. They'll be at lunch over the next couple of days and mention it. And if done right, they'll remember it months and years later. So I really believe that establishes a connection that cannot be replaced by a simple email. And I think it's also incumbent upon the student at any age, professional, uh, just starting out, you name it. The follow-up and follow-through would be the last thing I leave you with. That is key because you can have somebody attend an event, see you in action. You can make a great impression on someone, but unless you follow through, it's all for naught. So you've got to follow through and you can't just send an email. You can just that first night, but then send a follow-up note, handwritten, because you know what? When they get their mail, they're going to go right for that nice piece of stationery before they do the bill or anything else. And by mentioning something in that handwritten note that you about proves to them that you listened. And listening is sometimes the best gift and impression you can give.